Uh, welcome back to the program. This is Outbreak News This Week, and I am Robert Harriman. Clostridium difficile, or it's as it's more commonly known, C. diff, is an anaerobic bacterium found in the environment, and a certain percentage of the population carry the organism normally in their intestinal tract. However, when the normal intestinal flora is disrupted by antibiotic treatment, the C. diff can multiply and flourish, which can produce a toxin that can cause very severe, even life-threatening diarrhea. Um, Antibiotics are one way to treat C. diff infections. However, the infections frequently recur. Another therapy which has been proven to be very effective is fecal microbiota transplantation. I'm going to go ahead and call it fecal transplant, uh, the rest of the uh, interview, and uh, which I'll let my next guest explain in more detail. Joining me on the phone is the research director and founder of Open Biome, Mark Smith. Uh, Open Biome is a nonprofit nonprofit organization dedicated to expanding access to fecal transplants. Hello, Mark, and thanks for coming on the show today. Yeah, hi, Robert. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's great to have you. When I when I saw your story um, in another newspaper, I immediately went to your website, and you guys are definitely um, doing a great service, I have to say. Um, I guess what I'd like you to do is to go ahead and briefly start with a, a short history of Open Biome, and what exactly does your organization do? Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. So uh, we we started the organization um, uh, in part based on my research, which focuses on the microbiome. So I'm a, also a PhD student at MIT in the microbiology program there. And uh, we were doing a lot of research on the microbiome, and we sort of started off looking at, uh, you know, sort of disease associations and what's really exciting about fecal transplantation is it gives you the opportunity to see, uh, you know, not just sort of what bacteria are correlated with disease, but actually to see what happens when you, you know, actually change the composition of this community and, and, and sort of can learn about how that, how that actually impacts the disease state of the individual. And in the case of C. difficile, uh, you know, research that has been done by, by a, a number of other, uh, you know, doctors and, and, and researchers uh, actually around the world had already indicated that... Uh, FMT uh, fecal transplantation uh, actually works very well for for treating recurrent C. difficile infection. And uh, one of the problems with uh, with actually uh, receiving this treatment for patients and and uh, providing it for doctors was the the, the burden of needing to uh, screen and pre- screen donors uh, and prepare the material. And so, just like there are blood banks that provide uh, blood that's screened from healthy individuals to be sure that. You know the the blood that's needed for medical care isn't uh, isn't also uh, a, an avenue for spreading disease. Uh, you know, we decided to start a very similar organization that would essentially be uh, a stool bank uh, that would provide you know just like a blood bank, but mm-hmm. using using stool for this uh, this procedure. Okay, so can you go ahead and talk more about what a fecal transplant is and how it works biologically? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, so the way that a fecal transplant works, uh, sort of. Uh, mechanistically, <laughs> is uh, the, the the doctor will you know uh, screen the patient ahead of time to figure out if they have C. difficile. If they do and they have a history of recurrence, uh, they'll, they'll the sort of traditional approach is to find a donor, screen that donor, so make sure the donor doesn't have any common infectious agents. Then they you know take the stool that you guys are all familiar with and uh, they uh, homogenize it in a saline solution that prevents the cells from. Uh, from, from being popped or lysed with, uh, in, in, a, in a pure water solution. And uh, then they uh, administer it either through a colonoscopy, so that's kind of a, uh, the lower GI route, or through an, a nasogastric tube, which is a tube that runs up through your nose, down, down your throat, and into your stomach, and then and that's sort of the, the upper gastrointestinal uh, tract route of administration. So either of those are sort of uh, options, and, and both seem to work very well for treating uh C. difficile infection, and so uh, so that's that's sort of how the material is administered, and then the the actual uh, sort of science behind it is, is still sort of a, an active area of research. But what we believe is going on is that many healthy people carry C. difficile right. uh, frequently, and uh, and so 
what what's believed in, in, in these people. It's, it's in, in healthy individuals, it's usually not, not a problem. It's carried uh, sort of subpathogenically. And uh, what's believed to be happening is that the C. difficile is being out-competed by the normal bacteria that, 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 that reside in your gut. And uh, these bacteria sort of prevent the, the C. difficile from taking over and producing pathogens. And in, in, in cases where patients have been exposed to antibiotics, the C. difficile, which, which is resistant to these antibiotics, is able to take over the community, and, uh, and then it's able to, to produce these, these very dangerous toxins. And so uh, fecal transplantation is believed to work by sort of rebuilding this healthy gut community and uh, in, in out-competing the C. difficile and preventing it from, from uh, growing and, and releasing these toxins. Yeah, and, and there's numerous studies showing how effective this is. I've, I've heard many physicians talk about how effective this is. However, I have to ask about your relationship um, between Open Biome and the FDA. Um, I know there's been some back and forth between the FDA and physicians that think fecal transplants are fantastic, uh, issues of tighter regulations, et cetera. What is the current situation? Yeah, so, so right now, uh, F, the FDA is uh, the very difficult problem uh, for, from the, the regulatory perspective here because, you know, you have, you have this treatment uh, where there's, there's, there's some evidence that it's, that it's effective, but it, you know, still hasn't done, hasn't been subjected to this, you know, really rigorous uh, sort of safety and efficacy standard that the FDA uh, likes to see for very good reason. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's sort of a long history of the, the regulation of this that maybe we don't need to go into fully, but the, the 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 problem is if the FDA sort of uh, you know completely restricts access, then the concern is that people are going to be doing this sort of uh, without the oversight from the medical community in their homes and their in their you know in their bathrooms. Sure. Uh, and uh, you know there there's if you go online, you can look on YouTube, and there'll be tens of thousands of hits to videos of people doing fecal transplants at home. I uh, don't encourage you to to look at these videos, but right. <laughs> uh, but they uh, that you know there's there's a there's a, a very you know, active community of people that are doing this at home, uh, you know, sometimes without screening the donors, uh, there, are, there are a lot of risks to doing this kind of procedure. And so the FDA was, was very, I think, very uh, sort of compassionate and flexible. And what they decided to do um, was to allow what they call enforcement discretion. So, uh, you know, while they still view stool, uh, this may be surprising to many of you, they view stool actually as a drug uh, that's still investigational. Um, they allow uh, doctors... Uh, who are who are sort of using this to treat recurrent C. difficile uh, to to do the procedure without without requiring the pretty onerous uh, paperwork that's usually required from from drug companies. Yeah, and I saw one news source. I can't remember which paper, but I, f- I found it kind of funny. They call they refer to Open Biome as the Brown Cross. Um, mm-hmm. Where do your donations come from, and what type of testing do you do to ensure a good donation? Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, so the so I, I, we also found that to be a funny a funny analogy, uh, <laughs> and uh, so so we're we're based uh, out of a lab uh, at MIT, and all of our donors are, are recruited from the MIT community, uh, primarily graduate students and uh, uh, postdocs uh, within the MIT community, and uh, and so the uh, before before a donor can enter our uh, our program, we have them we first uh, they, they conduct a. A uh, pretty lengthy interview with a with a healthcare professional that sort of walks them through a number of risk factors, similar to the kind of interview you might conduct for uh, for blood screening. So, if you wanted to become a blood donor, and so it you know excludes patients or potential donors with uh, you know any history of metabolic disorders, uh, inflammatory disorders, uh, recent travel, uh, use of antibiotics. There, there are a number of uh, exclusion criteria there. You know, drug use and uh, uh, you know, high risk sexual behaviors as well. Uh, so, so sort of we, we start off with that just to exclude people that are you know, very likely to be unsuitable. But uh, but then and then after that we collect both a stool sample and a blood sample, and there is a set of seventeen different tests that uh, that that we send out to uh, uh, a, a, a standard sort of medical uh, screening laboratory, and they conduct a, a number of tests for for example for things like infectious agents like uh, HIV. Or hepatitis, or uh, bacterial pathogens like uh, Salmonella and E. coli, sure. and so they test the they test the stool to make sure that it uh, you know uh, doesn't have any of these common pathogens. And then, if the patient 
if the donor uh, passes these screens, then we begin collecting material from them over the course of a 60-day window. But the problem is that some material, some some infectious uh, diseases, uh, you, even even though you may carry them, they actually don't turn out to be positive. They won't they won't test positive in a uh, in a in a, a clinical assay until uh, you know, several weeks afterwards through a process called seroconversion. And so, so what we do is we actually hold the material in quarantine until the donor has been screened a second time uh-huh. to ensure that the uh, the donor the donor hasn't you know started to express uh, you know uh, sort of an immune reaction against the disease that was uh, was undetectable previously. So we conduct a, an initial initial uh, interview, then we conduct a stool and, and uh, blood based assays, collect material over a window, store it in a uh, we sort of homogenize it store it in cryoprotectin, which uh, enables us to freeze it, and then uh, freeze the material, then screen the donor a second time, and then release material that's sort of outside the seroconversion window. And that's the process that we use. Yeah, fascinating. Um, so if I'm a patient with C. diff and my doctor and I decide that fecal transplant is the best course of therapy, how does Open Biome come into play? How do we access your services? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So the the way that uh, you know doctors and patients can can access our services uh, would be to uh, you know so so first it's up to doctors' discretion whether you meet the criteria for this enforcement discretion. So if it's a recurrent C. difficile patient, and then the, the doctor should reach out to us, and uh, we're we're happy to uh, send material to the doctor. Usually, there's a little bit of paperwork to be done with their their institution, but um, you know, in emergency cases, we've been able to send material out even the same day, and, and we have, have supported a number of those sort of emergency procedures. Uh, and, uh, you know, as well, we've had many patients who don't haven't yet found a doctor who's, you know, sort of set up and has experienced providing FMT. And for uh, recurrent C. difficile patients, uh, you know, in many cases, we've been able to, to help them find a doctor that's, that's able to treat them as well. And, uh, you know, importantly, we don't provide any medical advice, but we're we're sort of happy to, to help do- uh, patients find doctors that are able to treat them. Oh, great work. Um, Mark, let me uh, ask you about the cost of your services and and how does how do people pay? Do you accept insurance? That that kind of stuff. Yeah, so so you know, our our view is we wanna uh we don't want uh sort of the ability to access material to uh, prevent limit uh patients' ability to, to get this treatment. You know, C difficile just for kind of perspective for, for folks that aren't familiar with it, uh in about to infect about a half million patients a year in the U.S., and about fourteen thousand people die a year from it. And for us, it's very frustrating because the the, the overall efficacy. If you take patients that have failed multiple rounds of antibiotics and give them an FMT, the the efficacy is about ninety percent. Right. So uh, the fact that there are so many patients that are still dying is we see as a big public health problem, and we don't want uh, sort of the logistical dif- difficulty and cost of uh, you know getting material and. Uh, screening it to to prevent access, and so uh, so we were uh, funded by a you know, significant donation from a family foundation. Very concerned about this, but wants to stay anonymous. And uh, they've uh, they've very generously funded us to get set up. And sort of the the criteria um, with this with this foundation was that you know we would they would provide the sort of initial uh, funding to get us off the ground, and then we would fund our ongoing operations based on a service fee that we charge to hospitals. So we charge a $250 uh, service fee for, for every, every uh, patient. And, uh, you know, to sort of, uh, for comparison, usually just, just doing the screening alone without the, um, you know, the cost of uh, uh, actually, you know, preparing the material and storing it and stuff is, is, is a little over $1,500. And so it was provided a big savings to, uh, to, to doctors and patients, but probably the biggest factor is it really just makes the procedure a lot more simple logistically and, in some cases, that's covered uh, by sort of the facility fees and the, from the hospital. Sometimes it's covered by insurance, and uh, you know sometimes patients do need to pay out of pocket. And our view is, you know, if they're if they're going to be paying out of pocket, much better for it to be you know a, a smaller fee. So that's that's how we that's how we've been able to make this sort of a, a sustainable service that, that we hope will be scalable to the you know the very large problem of the C. C. difficile epidemic right now. Right. Um- now, there's a lot of people out there that are suffering from other types of GI conditions, uh, IBS, Crohn's. Um, is Open Biome a place for them? 
Yeah, so so right now, Open Biome is, is, is not able to support uh, treatment for those conditions, but um, we're very happy to support uh, research from, you know, uh, doctors and, and, and other scientists like myself. And so, you know, our view is that uh, we sort of have a two-pronged mission with the organization. One is to uh, be able to, to treat patients right away that, uh, that, that are, um, you know, where, where there's evidence that this is an effective treatment, um, you know, so C. difficile patients. And then to facilitate research by, you know, many other sort of doctors and scientists that are interested in this area. So we're, we're in the process of working with a number of doctors to get set up to, to provide that as sort of an investigational therapy, but to provide treatment for conditions other than C. difficile, uh, because there, there, there really isn't the evidence yet that it's an effective treatment, you need to go through a very burdensome uh, process uh, of working with the SBA through this investigational new drug application. Right. And, uh, and so there are relatively few doctors that are able to do that, and it takes you know, uh, several months to get set up to do that. So we're in the process of uh, supporting uh, some of these uh, investigational new drug applications um, right now and sort of in the early stages, and we hope to be able to, you know, uh, help a lot of doctors, uh, you know, research that and and develop it. But but right now we're not we we don't have any that are set up yet, and uh, probably won't for the you know the next few months. And uh, you know for now, unfortunately, there's there's not much that we're able to do directly for those patients. Right. And uh, l- lastly, um, where can someone go to learn more about Open Biome and the product you offer? Yeah. So you know we've got a lot of information available on our website, which is openbiome dot org. D i o m e dot org, and uh, uh, there's there's a lot of information there, and we're happy to to take uh, you know, requests for information from from doctors and patients and just people that are interested in this from the public. And, and what's your website name? Openbiome dot org. O p e n b i o m e dot org. Yeah, that's right. Very good. Well, the idea is brilliant, and you guys are providing a great service for patients suffering from this horrible, horrible disease. I want to thank Mark Smith, uh, PhD with Open Biome. Um, appreciate you coming on today, Mark. Yeah, thanks so much, Robert. You bet. Really happy to share what we're doing. Fantastic. Thanks, man. All right. Take, take care. Bye. All right. Well, uh, a bunch of students up there in um, Massachusetts are just doing some incredible, incredible stuff up there. Uh, I encourage you to check them out, particularly if you're a sufferer of uh, C. difficile, openbiome.org, O-P-E-N-B-I-O-M-E.org. All right, we're going to go to another uh, break, and when we come back, I'm going to talk a little bit about that Chinese tapeworm case.